Oh, go away. Silence. I'm just so popular. Hi, Bartonella buddies. <laughs> Today, let's go over exactly what the science says about transmission of Bartonella and saliva. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jake. And before we get into today's video, I just want to show you my new apparel design. It says Bartonella Brave, which is more kid appropriate than Buck Bartonella and is more kid appropriate than my potty mouth in general. <laughs> As always, everything in the Bartonella Babe merch store, including this design, 25% uh, will go to the Bartonella Project at the North Carolina State University College of Be Veterinary Medicine. And lastly, we have this beautiful earring design, and they're going to come in a variety of color combos. Okay, now I'm done. So the first question is, has Bartonella DNA been found in the saliva of humans? And the answer is yes, and it's also been found in the saliva of cats and dogs. In a case report by Breitschwert and colleagues, a 50-year-old male veterinarian with fatigue, joint pain, balance issues, severe periodontal disease, and other symptoms was tested for Bartonella. He was positive for Bartonella via IFA serology and PCR from his blood sample, but I just want to focus on the periodontal and saliva samples. The PCR quote, generated amplification products from both samples. Efforts to sequence the amplicon from saliva was not successful. However, Bartonella vinsonii subspecies Burkhoffii was amplified and sequenced from the periodontal swab. Let's go over what that exactly means. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and I'm not going to go through the ins and outs of PCR, but if you want to learn more about that, I think the Khan Academy has some great educational resources, and I'll put a link to that in the video description box. When you do PCR, you have to sequence the DNA to ensure that you are picking up what you're intending to pick up and you're not getting a false positive. For example, Dr. Maggi and Dr. Breitschwer have shown that depending on the primers that you use for the PCR, you can get a false positive for Bartonella when testing molecular grade water, which is supposed to be sterile. So if you think you've gotten a hit for Bartonella, you have to sequence it because if the DNA doesn't quite match up, then you know you've gotten a false positive for that hit. So they got a hit for Bartonella in both the saliva and the periodontal swab, but there wasn't enough DNA to sequence that hit for the saliva swab, but there was for the periodontal swab. Breitschwert and colleagues hypothesized that perhaps they weren't successful in sequencing the DNA from the saliva because it was diluted by the saliva in the mouth, and this seems like a very likely explanation. Another likely explanation that they give is there could be more Bartonella DNA at the periodontal surface because Bartonella might be leaking through inflamed blood vessels. We know that Bartonella live in the red blood cells and in the cells that line the small blood vessels. We also know that those with periodontitis have gums that are swollen and more likely to bleed. So I asked the authors what the difference was between the saliva swab and the periodontal swab and was told that the saliva swab was just saliva and the periodontal swab, the male veterinarian, somewhat aggressively rubbed along the gingival surface. The authors state that, quote, detection of DNA in the oral cavity does not confirm the presence of viable, aka infectious, bacteria. However, caution should be exercised by dentists and physicians when examining the oral cavity of an individual with chronic Bartonella species bacteremia. So let's go over the research on whether or not the bacteria found in saliva is viable. So that same article says that over a hundred years ago, Bartonella quintana was transmitted to human volunteers when saliva was applied to scarified skin. So before we talk about that 100 year old study, I want to tell you what I learned in college. And that is when you cite a study, you have to read that study in full. So that's what I do here on my channel. I also learned that if Woods and Butler write that Brown and Sanchez found XYZ, you have to go and read what Brown and Sanchez wrote. You can't just take Woods and Butler's word for it. So I followed that rule in college and I found out I was in for a rude awakening. I cannot tell you how many times I have read the original source from front to back and have found the following things. The information was accidentally misrepresented, the information was purposefully misrepresented or cherry-picked, the information was not in that article at all, so maybe they miscited, which is actually kind of an easy thing to do. Don't ask me about my mental breakdown I had doing the citations for my dissertation. Or four, you read the article and you realize it's science. So you have to read the source material yourself because humans make mistakes, including me, because we're humans. 
So this study from 100 years ago, you can read on Google Books in full. I don't know why you'd want to do that. I didn't. What I did was I searched the book with the words saliva and sputum and read every section with those words. And this is what I found. They inoculated soldiers with a mixture of saliva and sputum, not just saliva. And sputum is different from saliva. It's a mixture of saliva and mucus coughed up from the respiratory tract. So in that book, they talk about sputum being infectious, not saliva being infectious. So they had soldiers cough up sputum and spit it out, and then they mixed it all together. Sputum stew for breakfast. It gets better. They then made two separate one square centimeter abrasions on the soldier's arms and rubbed the mixture into their arms. The scarifying means that the skin was abraded or damaged. Think scar and access to the bloodstream. From here, I'm not gonna lie, this study from World War I gets real foobar, which is slang from World War II that stands for f***ed up beyond all recognition. I read and reread this thing to try and make sense of it and even made my mom read parts of it to make sure I wasn't missing something because it was so foobar, so let me explain. The first foobar thing was they said that there were five experiments studying the infectious infectiousness of saliva and sputum, but I could only find three. So let's discuss those. Could they count in 1918? Or maybe I can't count in 2021. Two soldiers named Quinn and Driscoll. I actually think it's really funny because it's so old that they're actually naming the people in the study. So Quinn and Driscoll were given the same mixture of saliva and sputum of three different soldiers that had an acute case of trench fever to the scarified areas on their skin, and they did not become sick with an acute case of trench fever. Another soldier named Kenny was also given saliva and sputum from the same three soldiers as Driscoll and Quinn, but that saliva and sputum were from different days of those three soldiers' illness, and he was given the saliva and sputum of a fourth soldier. Kenny developed trench fever eight days later. Now here's where it gets even more foobar. Quinn, Driscoll, and Kenny previously were in experiments where it is very possible they were exposed to Bartonella. Quinn and Driscoll were exposed to lice that were infected with Bartonella. Hi everyone, editing Jake here coming in to correct myself. I said that they were exposed to lice that contained Bartonella, but really they were exposed to lice that had fed on soldiers who had acute cases of trench fever. So we don't know for sure whether this lice had Bartonella. Okay, back to the video. And Kenny was given an infusion of plasma from a soldier with trench fever. None of them became sick in these previous experiments, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't become infected. When you use human subjects that only a few months prior were exposed to lice that contained Bartonella and plasma from a soldier with trench fever, you're really adding too many confounding variables for these experiments to be of much use. As I said, FUBAR. Lastly, these experiments were done when they were still calling Bartonella a virus, and we can't assume that their lab practices were sterile or that their methods were sound, and as I reread that document, I realized that analyzing it any deeper was a huge waste of time, and now I've just wasted your time. You're welcome. So what's not useless is the amplification of Bartonella from the periodontal swab and the saliva swab, but we still don't know whether Bartonella is viable in saliva. Every microbe or virus has its likely ways of spreading and its less likely ways of spreading and its impossible ways of spreading. And I think it's pretty hard to determine between highly unlikely and impossible. So as an example, we know that we can amplify HIV RNA from saliva, but HIV isn't passed through saliva unless in rare cases when someone bites another person and it gains access to the bloodstream. Rarely, people can get HIV from open mouth kissing, but both people have to have open sores or bleeding gums because HIV needs access to the bloodstream. So let's take tuberculosis as another example because learning is fun. Tuberculosis is spread when the bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis is released into the air by someone who is coughing, <coughs> singing, la, 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 la. shouting, hey. or speaking. Uh. Shh. And another person inhales the bacteria and the bacteria settles in their lungs. And not everyone that is exposed to the bacteria becomes infected. And not everyone that becomes infected gets sick with tuberculosis. 
It is interesting and important to note that tuberculosis is not spread by sharing food or drink, shaking someone's hand, kissing, or even sharing toothbrushes. We do not know definitively from cat or dog experiments if Bartonella can be spread through saliva. It may be that cats can transmit Bartonella only when they are, are recently or currently infested with fleas and flea poop with the Bartonella is in their mouths, and then they bite and the flea feces gain access to the bloodstream. Or if cats can transmit through their bite in the absence of any fleas and any feces. And the same goes for dogs. Would you bite the hand that feeds? Would you chew it till it bleeds? Piper's a big Nine Inch Nails fan. As you can tell, she's super hardcore. <laughs> One study housed two uninfected kittens with five infected kittens for five months, and neither of the two uninfected kittens became infected, and also kittens have a much higher bacterial load than adult cats. Furthermore, scientists have shown that cats living in places where fleas are endemic, like warm, moist climates, have higher rates of infection with Bartonella than in places that are where fleas are not endemic, like Norway. However, there are case reports and anecdotal reports of cats or dogs transmitting Bartonella through their bites, but there have not been any experimental studies done on this topic, to my knowledge. So let's just say, hypothetically, it was viable in saliva. Then we'd, we would have to ask how often often is it viable? Is it viable depending on the host's immune system, whether the infection is acute or chronic? Is it viable depending on the animal? And is it viable depending on how virulent the strain is? And if it is viable, is there an infectious dose? There's a great blog post by Galaxy Diagnostics where they say, quote, the likelihood that a pathogen will overwhelm the immune system and cause a person to become ill has to do with the dose of the exposure. So if saliva has viable Bartonella, how often is there enough to get someone sick? And if there is enough viable bacteria to create an infectious dose, does it need access to the bloodstream? Most likely, yes. And I think that's the most important part of this whole video, access to the bloodstream. So steering clear of bites from cats and dogs and humans is a good idea. Cat and dog bites can be really nasty and can spread a lot of pathogens to you. There are two final points I would like to make. The first point is that two people can read the exact same set of data and come away with two completely different takes. Like art, subjective. Two people could review the scientific literature and one person could come away saying that the risk of bite transmission in the absence of fleas is low and another person can come away saying that the risk is medium. And so the second point is that two people can come away with the same conclusion but then take different risks and make different decisions in their life. For example, two people could come to the same conclusion that the risk of bite transmission in the absence of fleas is low, and one person might want to get rid of their cat, and the other person would never dream of it. The assessment of what risks you are willing to take is up to you and may not always be rational, and that's okay. I mean, lots of people are afraid of flying when statistically driving is much more dangerous. I really want to make helping people navigate their chronic illness with these edutainment videos my job, and there are a few ways you can help me do that. Give this video a thumbs up, share it wherever you can, and make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. You can find the link to my Etsy store and my Bartonella Babe merch in the video description box, and 25% goes to Bartonella Research. And if you are in a position to do so, you can donate to my channel via PayPal or Venmo, and the information for that is in the video description box as well. Bye, Bartonella buddies! My tongue is really short. <laughs> as high as it comes. Mm. Mm. Uh.